good evening. So the origins of my talk tonight go back a number of years to when I was sitting down to watch the nightly news and two news stories came on about Iraq. Now the first news story was about the Iraqi recruiting centers and apparently enthusiasm was so great for joining the new Iraqi army that the line went out the door, down the street and around the corner. So much so that the insurgents had started a campaign of car bombing to try to stem the tide of enthusiasm for joining the uh, new Iraqi army. The second news story was about the performance of the new Iraqi army in Mosul. And it wasn't very flattering. So what happened was that they were deployed down to Mosul and these new Iraqi units deserted along the way. So uh, the Sunni and Shia and Kurds, they were deployed together down to Mosul and they decided along the road, why am I fighting with these guys against my co-ethnics? And they, the, uh, these new units began to disintegrate. So this got me thinking about armies and the model of army that we're trying to impose on these countries. Now this is really important. It's important for the host countries themselves because security is the concrete foundation upon which everything else is built. Whether you're talking about electricity and plumbing or uh, the rule of law and good governance. None of that can be built if there's car bombs going off in the street, IEDs and there's ambushes on every second corner. It's also important for the United States. The United States has the most powerful military in human history, and they can't win. They can't win in Vietnam, they can't win in Afghanistan, they can't win in Iraq. And the problem is, is that they, they can't rebuild these militaries in these countries. Passing the baton of security onto a reliable and effective host nation military is the exit strategy. It's how you win and they don't seem to be able to do this very well at the moment. So I started thinking more broadly about armies. And when you t think about armies, you would probably conjure up the image of uh, these mixed national armies. It doesn't matter about your ethnicity, your race, your religion, whether or not you came from the south or the north or the east or the west. We you all get climb on the bus together and you all become Marines or you all become soldiers. You're all mixed up in this national army. But this model is really recent and it's quite odd. Think back over 60,000 years of human history. Back when we first have evidence of people uh, gathering together to fight other people, you'll be fighting in your tribe. You'll be fighting amongst with your brother, your cousin, your father. Fast forward again to the Middle Ages. And you might have all watched that Mel Gibson movie, Braveheart, where you've got the villager on the field of battle, and he says, I'm not going to fight for, uh, die for these bastards. And the, the whole army starts to disintegrate. That villager is talking to people he's known his entire life. Next door neighbors, cousins, brothers again. And that army was either all going to stay on that field of battle, or was all going to desert as one. You can't desert on your next door neighbor. How do you look their mother in the, in, in the, in the face? Fast forward again to the First World War, and local recruitment was still the model that most armies was built, built upon. The slogan was that you would join together, you'd train together, you'd bark together, and you would fight together. The pre-existing social bonds was going to be the glue that was going to hold these units together so they wouldn't just run away, that they would fight for uh, as a band of brothers together. What you could add to this propaganda picture, however, was you all die together. The First World War changed everything. It changed things for two reasons. The first was that the weapons of war had gotten to a point where entire units could be wiped out in seconds. Imagine what would happen if an artillery shell was to fall upon this trench line. All the sons of one town could be wiped out in seconds. And you see this as you travel around small towns around the country. You have two small towns that would seem similar in every way, except that one has a war memorial with a load of names, and the next town has relatively few names. Why? Because, unfortunately, one 
a group of soldiers had an artillery shell for them, or that they were sent to, to attack a particularly tough trench line, whereas the next town along may have got off fairly lightly. The other thing that World War II changed was nationalism. That governments learnt that they could beat the drum, that they could wa wave the flag, and young men would rally to the cause. That they no longer needed to recruit locally in order to uh, attract soldiers and have them stick together. So when we think about armies, we think about these new armies, this, this national army of them all being mixed together. But yet, this is a model that we're trying to impose on these countries and it's just not working. One, nationalism hasn't risen to the point where people's primary loyalty is to the country rather than to their local neighbourhood. The second is that often the conflict in these countries isn't going to be the type that's going to wipe out ent entire units all in one go. It's often insurgency and guerrilla warfare rather than the mass slaughter that we saw in the First World War. So this first approach may not be wor is, isn't working, and it may not be appropriate for these countries that we're trying to build uh, new armies in. A second approach, though, would be to just group all the co-ethnics together. So you'd go into Iraq, and you'd build an army based upon a Kurdish army, a Sunni army, and um, a Shia army. Now, this isn't going to work either, because you're building ready-made ethnic militias for when you depart. So that second model is probably inappropriate as well. So what my research is currently looking at is a third way, something between these two extremes. Imagine an army where the unit that you wake up with are all from the local neighbourhood, the, the unit that you eat with, that you train with, that you pray with, that you fight with, are all co-ethnics from the same background um, and the, the same community that you come from. The glue is already pre-existing in the unit. Yet, within the macro unit, you're mixed up. So perhaps you could imagine an institution where at the company level or the battalion level, you're all co-ethnics and you're, you're all being locally recruited, but yet at the brigade and regimental level, you're all mixed up. So institutionally, you can't link in with other co-ethnics um, to form an ethnic militia when the international forces go home. So this institutional approach isn't going to be a silver bullet. So soldiers will still desert if you don't pay them. Soldiers will still desert if their officers are hopeless. But the model that we've been applying in South Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq clearly isn't working. And as we look forward, to, well, not look forward, but we look, for, uh, look in the future to future operations in Syria, in Yemen, in poss possibly Libya, then we need to approach this with a new institutional model. So wars aren't won these days through breaking things. Wars are won these days through fixing them. And the sooner that our armies can learn to fix foreign militaries in a different way to the way that we do them, the better it's going to be for everybody. Thank you.